Welcome to Democratic Television, a program of the Santa Clara County Democratic Party that brings the insights, perspectives, and attitudes of our always thoughtful Democratic guests. Our focus today is on the 2020 election, and our guest is Otto Lee. Otto is the former Sunnyvale mayor, and he's our current endorsed candidate for Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Otto, welcome to the show. Yes, thank you, Bill, for having me today. Truly a pleasure. Thanks for being with us. Well, I think that um, we often begin these shows talking a little bit about our, our, our guests' uh, biographical information and background, but we've had that conversation somewhat recently, and I feel um, uh, you know, compelled to get into um, your current race. Um, before I do that, though, I, I admire the backdrop, uh, your virtual backdrop. It's, uh, it's Sunnyvale, and I know Sunnyvale's come a long way in, in recent years, and, and you're to be credited for that. Um, but we've been friends a long time, and, and I remember at Central Committee, uh, your invitation to um, uh, supporters to come out and walk for you when you were first running for Sunnyvale City Council. And um, as I, re I recall it distinctly, because I don't think I've ever had quite that invitation, uh, it was uh, to meet me at the corner of Murphy and something else, uh, or whatever street uh, was in the neighborhood that you were walking that weekend. And uh, you'd hand out packets, and we'd all walk from uh, from from there. Uh, and that's obviously a whole world ago. In fact, your, your primary election uh, that got you into the runoff for this uh, Board of Supervisors seat was done in the pre-COVID time. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and now here you are running for Board of Supervisors in you know, uh, the Santa Clara County, a county of two million people, and, and in some ways uh, a, a leader and, and a main um, uh, jurisdiction for this uh, pandemic. And the whole world has changed. Uh, so I, how has that changed for you just as a candidate, just as just on that grassroots uh, kind of approach? Uh, what do you do with that? And, and, and uh, how do you transform uh, your successful strategy as a grassroots candidate into this environment? Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, good memory. Uh, that was probably the, uh, the corner of uh, Murphy and, uh, say, Evelyn, for example, yes. which is where, where we are, if you can see right here. Now, obviously, it's just a backdrop because if I were really out there, I would be wearing a mask right now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, the, uh, that was 2003, so that was a good 17 years ago, Bill. So we've gone a long way, and you know, right. we were both teenagers back then, right? We were the young Democrats, <laughs> right? Yes, we were yes, probably we were troublemakers. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, good troubles, that is. Yes. Um, and and the, the, uh, the campaigning certainly has changed a lot. We're very uh, honored and humbled. Uh, to have been able to make it to the uh, runoff election for the general election uh, with, um, you know, we knocked on over 17,000 doors between me, myself and many of our volunteers uh, walking and hitting the doors. Uh, so, you know, as you know, when we knock on doors, talking to voters, you know, like I said, shaking hands, kissing babies, well, guess what? All those are illegal now. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, well, how do you reach out to the voters? How do you GOTV get out the vote? Uh, and I think that's uh, going to be a very different uh, environment. But at the same time, it's also meaning that it's even more important to do the field work to get people out and let, let people know that it's safe to vote and it's important to vote. Uh, as we all know, uh, Santa Clara County and now the state of California as well has now converted to all mail-in ballots. Uh, all the envelopes will be sent to uh, each individual's registered mailing address. Uh, every voter can just fill it out and return the ballot after they sign it. It's very important to sign it and date it and then mail it back without paying for postage. Uh, but so in order to get a word out, obviously, you know, mail will be important, which is quite expensive. Uh, but it's good. You know, we're keeping the uh, post office open. I always remind that myself that whenever I pay the postage bills. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the social media, uh, electronic uh, ways to reach out to voters is so important. And phone, of course, phone banking is important, texting is important. So there's just so many other ways which is non-knocking that we'll need to reach out to make sure that the voters know about, not only the date of election, but that uh, we don't get the drop off. Because many people, as you know, they would vote for the president and then just kind of ignore the rest of the ballot. And we don't want them to do that. That's what we call a drop off. And that's where our party comes in, you know, your job. Uh, as the county chair would be to educate our voters how important those down ballot votes are, especially the, like you say, the county supervisors, school board members, city council members. Those are very important races down ballots that making sure that the um, our voters vote for. And also our propositions as well. There are quite a few important propositions, 15, 16s, will be on the ballot this time as well. 
I, I agree. It's a, it's a challenge for all of us in, in politics to make sure that we, uh, we get our voters out. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that expression, our voters, I think that a lot of grassroots campaigning, at least traditionally, has been to identify supporters and activate them and make sure that they turn out. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the knocking on doors has always been part of that. Uh, you mentioned uh, phone banking. Presumably, people would be doing that from home. Are, what are the strategies that your campaign is using in to to reach people in this environment? Uh, as you pointed out, direct mail is is expensive and and hard to do, so that requires fundraising. Um, what's it What's it been like? What are you, What are you focusing on? Uh, I would say social media is one where we have <clears throat> invested quite a bit of uh, work on. We have made quite a bit of uh, quite a few uh, videos. Uh, during this past uh, month, so approximately, I would say approximately one video a week that we've been releasing to talk about various things. We'll celebrate, like for example, Fourth of July or Father's Day. Uh, we we have a video made for that, or we'll have a topic of certain individuals we have recommend. We have an interview. For example, we actually just interviewed a couple of weeks ago with our state chair, uh, Rusty Hicks. Uh, and frankly, I would say it's probably not easy to get Rusty uh, all the way from from uh, from where he is. But because of Zoom, the world's suddenly a lot smaller. So we're able to get uh, some pretty big stars in some of our interviews just because of the fact that uh, everybody's so comfortable doing video interview these days. Uh, and, and this is one good way to help spread the message uh, in, the, in the environmentally green fashion. You know, we're not burning paper or we don't, we're actually doing everything electronically. Uh, but at the same time, it's more um, active. And, and you know, sometimes they say, you know, picture is a thousand words, but the video is a thousand pictures. Right and more, so I think it's actually more information we're able to be given uh, to our voters that way as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Uh, that auto, uh, you mentioned uh, down ballot races and races from the presidency on down, and I know we're both really engaged in all of that work. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody knows that you're a Democratic National Committee member, and uh, so I know that you must have ideas about. Um, uh, getting people to vote during this p a global pandemic throughout the country because there are so many races that are um, mm -hmm. so important to us. What are some of the other races that uh, you and other members of the DNC might be asking Democrats to focus on? Right. So obviously winning the White House is needless to say, but uh, in some ways you know, I would argue that it's almost more important to take back the Senate, uh, the U.S. Senate. Uh, the current makeup is that there are 53 Republican and 47 Democrat independents are both together. And so we're basically only three votes down. Uh, and assuming we get the presidency, uh, we really only need three turns on the Senate in order to win back the control of the Senate. Uh, and this year is one that is extremely exciting. We've got Arizona with Mark Kelly, our astronaut, running against Martha McSally. Uh, polls have him, you know, 10 points ahead right now or something like that. So it's really exciting. If anybody recall, uh, Mar uh, not only is he the astronaut, but he's also the husband of our Congresswoman Gabby Gifford, uh, uh, who, uh, who was shot uh, at, the, at the town hall when he was, uh, she was serving as a Congresswoman. So uh, really amazing candidates. Uh, Colorado with John Hickenlooper, uh, former governor, that will be running. Uh, another one that, uh, that would be a state that's considered a red state, but we have a really good chance to pick up is Montana. Steve Bullock, the governor, is also running there as well. Uh, and so uh, uh, Jamie Harrison over in South Carolina, who's a good friend of mine, is running against Lindsey Graham. Um, and even the uh, Maine, state of Maine right now, with uh, uh, the, the very uh, exciting race. Uh, Susan Collins has been there for a little too long, we think, and given some of her recent votes, a lot of people really want to unseat her as well. So we've got a really, really great race coming through that we have a good shot of uh, potentially picking up a seat. Mm -hmm. So thank you for those reflections, Otto. Um, I think in a normal uh, time, a, a DNC member like you would be making your plans to travel to Milwaukee for the convention, and that's obviously not happening. Do you have any thoughts about that, or, or is it just a thing that we have to live with and deal with because of the, what, the crisis that we're facing? You know, the, just like they say, you, when, when life gives a lemon, you make lemonade. Well, mm -hmm. one thing good about not having to travel to uh, convention uh, is that you wouldn't have to spend all that airfare and very expensive hotel rooms. Every convention hotel, they usually jack up the price by double or more. Uh, so all that money we're able to save from the convention that would be able to use to hopefully donate to those races that we hopefully could turn on. That's what I'm telling my fellow uh, uh, attendees. Uh, all, all, the other thing that potentially could be a benefit from this as well is when you're at a convention, so many things are happening at the same time and there's no way you can attend to all of them. So you kind of split yourself very thin, running around 
uh, and uh, and only obtain probably a, a half or third of the events you want to go to. Uh, in the Zoom environment, is different. You probably can, I'm sure some of us probably have two laptops going, two Zoom meetings going at the same time uh, if they overlap. And then that's the kind of stuff that we actually can do is really multitask that way by being multiple places. So there are many ways to do it. And I think that the engagement actually, I think would be far, far higher. So uh, obviously not everybody can afford to go and live, you know, attend the convention uh, in person, but this time around being in Zoom, I have a feeling that nationally, a lot more uh, people, even though they may not be delegates, due to the nature of the meeting, most of the meetings are actually open to the public. Uh, definitely uh, many uh, engaged Democrats can attend a lot of those meetings. So it sounds like in some ways it would uh, almost democratize the thing a little bit more than, exactly. than usual. Yes. What do you think about exactly. our, our, our presidential candidate? Will he get featured uh, in the way that um, uh, we need as Democrats for him to get his momentum? Oh, I, I think so. I mean, the, the airwaves, I mean, you cannot uh, basically turn the news or any type of a uh, uh, social media or post uh, these days without seeing the presidential candidates' names one or the other or both. Uh, so I do think that uh, the the what what is so exciting about Joe Biden is something that would be featured very prominently. Uh, and I do believe that this time around, you know, I think we've a lot of lessons learned from 2016. And I think those errors that was made back then, uh, certainly I don't think would be made this time around. And in terms of focusing on our swing states and our, our voters in our swing states, I think this time around, uh, we will not only focus better, but at the same time with the pandemic uh, going on right now, many of those states that are swing states, for example, like say Florida, which is a very, very important swing state from every presidential election as we all understood from you know George Bush days, how he won followed by so-called 400 votes of those hanging chads. Uh, right now, Florida is the, uh, middle of the pandemic. It really is epicenter in Miami. And I think it, from the, the horrible situation where we're going through, I think people understand that the uh, leadership of the current Republican governor is really something that we don't need. Uh, and I think all that hopefully would get people to realize the importance of having a democratic uh, uh, president to lead this uh, country forward. Well, thank you, Ada, for uh, your reflection so far in the program. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, for um, an announcement and come back with the second segment. Um, I, I want to ask you more about Santa Clara County and your race uh, and uh, what you hope to accomplish and, and work on as uh, a member of the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. Mm -hmm. We'll be back in, uh, in just a minute. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Hi, I'm State Senator Jerry Hill. Thanks for watching today, and thanks for your involvement. You need to do what I've been doing for many years, and that's get involved, get things done so that you can improve your community. The only way you can do that is to participate, and you can participate in the Santa Clara County Democratic Party because they are progressive, and they make things happen, and they bring the services home for all of the individuals, those who can least afford it, those who need it, the most vulnerable in our society who need the help that they can and the support for education. All of those things are important. Those are the values that I hold dear and I know those are the values that you hold dear. So please do what you can to help join, participate, be a member of the San Santa Clara County Democratic Party. And you can do that by making a phone call, looking at the information on your screen now and making a difference for all of us. Thanks for watching. Welcome back. Welcome back for the second half of our show with Otto Lee. Otto is the former mayor of Sunnyvale, and he is our Democratic Party endorsed candidate for Santa Clara County Supervisor District 3. Otto, welcome back for the second part of our show. Uh, before I forget to, add, to have you do this, um, the county is a big county, and uh, which of the communities of the county are, are within Santa Clara County uh, District 3? Yeah, thank you, Bill. For the 2 million people living in Santa Clara County, uh, there are five supervisors. So each supervisor basically represents approximately 400,000 residents. Uh, for District 3, which is currently uh, represented by uh, Supervisor Dave Cortezzi, uh, the district is very large. It includes the north part of Sunnyvale, going up to Alviso, into Milpitas, the entire city of Milpitas, uh, and, uh, and then it's coming back down to San Jose, including Bayresa, up to the east side foothills and come back down to include the whole Evergreen area. 
So it's a very, very large district. And I'll tell you, to drive from one end to the other end of the district uh, without traffic uh, would take at least uh, uh, 30 minutes. So that's, that shows you how far this, uh, how big this district really is. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, um, uh, I guess the use of Zoom and the absence of traffic going to work is probably makes it easier to get around the district if you're able to do that um, right. in, this, in these times. You mentioned the county, and I think that uh, in this pandemic time, uh, a lot of, of, of uh, people living in the area have been a little more aware of the county government. I think people mm -hmm. used to say, well, what does the county do? Uh, and now people seem to understand that there's a county health officer. But in addition, the county is also a major health care provider. Can you just say a little bit about what it is that the county does? Great. So the county really is the public safety net for this 2 million people population. Uh, what I mean by that is it has the jurisdiction of the hospital health care system. Uh, Valley Medical Center, of course, is our um, foundation for that. And we most recently also purchased two other hospitals, O'Connor's and St. Louis, uh, through the bankruptcy of uh, the, the, the company, uh, that, the for-profit company that owned it. Uh, and uh, besides that, we also have the jurisdiction of our the criminal uh, social justice system. Namely, you've got the sheriffs, you've got the courts, and also the county jail is under the jurisdiction of the county. Uh, other areas that people may not be as familiar with is, of course, the um, uh, various uh, nonprofits that the county has fund to provide the social services, whether it's domestic violence, drug abuse, uh, prevention, and some veteran services as well. Uh, and county parks is what I think people are sometimes very familiar with, uh, that uh, we spend a lot of good times uh, at our beautiful parks. Uh, so the county really is uh, fascinating in terms of the number of facets. Of course, there's county fire as well that covers the unincorporated area of the county. Um, it's uh, the agency that I honestly think is least understood uh, by most people, but, but in so many ways, it, it touches really everybody in many ways, directly and directly. On transportation, BTA is technically still under the county uh, uh, as well, along with the, uh, the expressways. When you drive on Lawrence Expressway and all the expressways, uh, uh, Capital Expressway, those are all county roads as well. So uh, that sounds like a pretty complicated set of uh, resources to manage, even in non-pandemic times. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, uh, can you say when uh, you're in campaign mode? What do you say about your background and your skill set that you feel prepares you well to to take on a role? As you say, there's only five supervisors, and there's of course the professional staff, but the executive authority mm -hmm. is shared among the supervisors. That's right. Yeah. So we do have a county executive uh, mm -hmm. that's hired by the five supervisors. Um, the my my background, I think, most relevant probably is uh, is a combination. As uh, you and I both are uh, educated as patent attorneys, so we went both went to law school. But besides that, I did get a degree in uh, uh, my degree was in engineering over uh, uh, chemical engineering in, in Berkeley. But really, it's the, the process of learning how to think, uh, and then my uh, Navy logistics background, which was the kind of the uh, finance uh, uh, manager for the the Navy. Uh, I think helps me in terms of learning how to balance the books, how to be fiscally uh, responsible, uh, and to make sure that uh, we have the right resources uh, needed to help our county move forward, whether it's money or whether it's PPEs that our nurses and our doctors, frontline uh, defenders uh, of our healthcare system is really needing. So those are, I think, the important skills that I'm bringing along with the, also the eight-year uh, uh, service on the uh, uh, city council where I was serving as council member and, and, and uh, the mayor to learn about how cities and counties and the state and how all that works together. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you, Lado. I think all that experience sounds very relevant to this job. Um, you mentioned your Navy background. And we're both patent lawyers and we're both Navy uh, veterans. Uh, both, go uh, Navy. Met, yes, go <laughs> Navy. You mentioned your service and the fact that you had some very specific training in finance as part of that, but you also had some experience in training in, in I would say, crisis management or doing a, a job in a crisis context. And, and I guess that uh, I'll give you a chance to say a little bit about that and maybe mention your lapel pin, which I recognize as a Navy <laughs> officer, and just let the, the non-Navy folks and uh, who might see the show understand what that is and how it relates to your service. Well, thank you, Bill. So uh, 
this is actually my second run for this position. In 2008, I actually ran for this position. I actually lost to Dave Cortesi, but we have become really good friends thereafter. And right after the election, I was actually called up to serve in Iraq. So 2009, I was deployed in Baghdad at Camp Victory. Uh, when I arrived, uh, President Obama just became the new president, and the first order of Iraq that he ordered was to draw down of our troops by the end of uh, 2011. Uh, so my job there as one of the logistics officers was to help uh, design the plan of how to close out over 200 uh, bases that we have, those FOBs, uh, and also bring the 150,000 troops home while under contact, which is certainly no uh, small feat. Uh, the lapel pin you mentioned was uh, the, the one of the huge honor that I was able to get for serving during that time. Uh, you know, running outside the wires, we call it, and you know, uh, escaping from IEDs and one water landed 90 feet from me and I survived that one, so I was very fortunate. Uh, and that was a bronze medal that I got, so I was very honored to have the opportunity to learn about uh, uh, all this crisis uh, management that she mentioned. And with the COVID we're going through right now, I believe that was the good experience I have. Hopefully I could bring this experience to the county as well. Well, thank you, Otto, for your, for your service, especially for your, your wartime service. I think that uh, everybody knows that when a mortar lands 90 feet away from you, it throws a bunch of shrapnel in a bunch of different directions. And, and uh, mm -hmm. we're fortunate that it didn't, uh, didn't harm you in, in, in that or any other incident. So it is a crisis time um, in so many ways. Uh, it, you mentioned the role of the county uh, it extends even to policing through the sheriff's department and um, um, the jail as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that jail is, I think that not everybody realizes, but the realignment that was done some years back to sort of resolve overcrowding and a budget crisis at the state level has really made the jail, um, the county jail, something of a, of a state prison for some uh, inmates. Uh, they're facing COVID challenges. They've had uh, uh, issues with uh, mistreatment of prisoners, and mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty challenging uh, environment. And we've had these historic Black Lives Matters protests this uh, spring and summer, um, and uh, that have really drawn a lot of attention to policing and, and uh, use of force policies. Uh, what are your thoughts about the opportunities and the, and the needs uh, for the county supervisors to address with respect to the Sheriff's Department and, and police policy? Right. So talk about the way the state prison is working. I, I honestly don't believe it's a, it's a good system to have state prisoner be you know, kind of dumped into the county jails thinking it's the same because it really isn't. Because at the end of the day, county jails are really designed for short term stay, shall we say, for people with a conviction of less than one year. So when people are stayed there longer, because all the services that the state prisons provide is not, a, is not provided for by, by the uh, county jail, number one. Number two is uh, the terms of release and all that is actually quite different. Uh, and and so, so in many ways, I don't believe county jails really is the proper place to, to be placing our state prisoners for, for one. Um, as far as the Black Lives Matter issue, uh, I think the social equity uh, of the different racial disparities uh, is so clear. Uh, I think George Floyd's death and his video has really uh, woke the, the movement, not just in one place, but really nationally highlighting the uh, issues that we have with the community and policing. Uh, and I do see that many, many uh, uh, long overdue reforms on our uh, social uh, and, and public safety uh, has been brought forth. And I think it's something that is really, really needed uh, for a long time. And I'm very glad to finally see them happening in our community. Uh, clearly, uh, there's a lack of training, a lack of uh, um, engagement by a lot of these uh, uh, different communities. And as you know, the strength of our public safety uh, police is not based on the weaponry or the bombs or the, or the, or the flashbangs uh, that the military use or tear gas. The strength of our, our, our police is really the relationship and the trust that our, our police officer have built with the local residents in our community. I think this is something that has to be working uh, better. Uh, and, and in that sense, I would say San Jose certainly has a less stellar record, you know, this time around compared to some of the other cities like Milpitas or Sunnyvale. We, I was able to go to both of the marches in Milpitas and Sunnyvale. It was very peaceful. The police were out there directing traffic. Mopi's police chief actually came out and spoke to the protesters. Uh, and when he was being jeered at by a couple of uh, protesters, the rest of the protesters actually uh, defended the police chief. So I think those are the type of community trust that's been built 
that we really need in different cities. And this is something, there's a lot of lesson learned, I think. And I don't really see this should be a negative. Uh, it should be a positive that I think we have better uh, outcome in the future. And let's not come uh, mixed up protesters from the, the, the actual people who steal and break into stores and steal things. Those are not, not protesters. They are just thieves. So I just want to make that very clear because people sometimes lump together, especially with the guy in the White House who likes to do that. I want to make that very clear. But uh, and I'm thankful for so many of those people coming out. Uh, Thank you. Students. Thank you, Adam, for making that distinction, that distinction clear. Uh, I don't want to run out of time to have you tell us how can how can uh, you know constituents and others reach out to you and contact you about your campaign for county supervisor. Great, yeah. Auto Lee O T T O L E E dot org is our website. It's probably the best way to reach out to us for either volunteering or looking for uh, uh, any ways to help us. Whether we talk about the donations and whatnot. So I really appreciate anybody who's willing to. Uh, to help us. Uh, obviously, volunteers are very, very needed to win the campaign, uh, and uh, autoe.org is the best way to reach us. Otto, we've only got about a minute left, but I want to uh, ask you about one last thing. Uh, many know that you have an immigrant story and that you came to, from, uh, to the U.S. from Hong Kong as a, as a child, and uh, Hong Kong's having um, uh, an experience now in in uh, having China impose some restrictions on them. Do you have any reactions ab about that or thoughts about that? Yes, uh, the reason I, my family came to the United States in 1982 was because Communist China was going to take over Hong Kong from, at that point, the British colony. Uh, and we knew that the loss of, of potential freedom uh, is a real uh, threat, and that's why we came to the U.S. Uh, as we have seen since July 1st, the National People's Congress has basically shut the law to Hong Kong with basically no input from the Hong Kong people. Uh, and it's a very stark warning and, and, and uh, uh, to the people living in Hong Kong that things are really changing. The freedom of press, freedom of assembly, uh, freedom of speech, uh, and merits of you know, privacy and uh, protection is, is being changed. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll all have to uh, join you in, in keeping a close watch on that in the future and best of Definitely. wishes and feelings for mm -hmm. the people of Hong Kong and their freedom. Yes. Thank you, Otto Lee, and thank you all for watching DTV. Uh, give us a call at 408-445-9500 or visit our website at www.sccdp.org. Help us to make a difference. We will see you on the campaign trail.